brand new program uh, that has never been tested before. I think Maya has told you about her experience. We have experience with uh, dual eligibles today. Uh, these, these programs have to be, uh, as I understand it, with existing SNPs, uh, special needs programs, uh, with experience in these counties to make it work. Uh, we're not sitting uh, around waiting for uh, this experience to come to us. We, we have outreach going on to uh, uh, new providers. Uh, we have outreach going on to uh, providers of long-term services and supports, uh, to the counties and other interested stakeholders. We have training programs going on today uh, with our staff, and we're staffing up for this purpose. Um, I testified in front of the Senate Subcommittee on Health in 2009 asking about readiness for SPDs and would we have, uh, would we be ready for that, for the seniors and persons with disabilities? And Dave Jones asked me, where are you going to find the doctors for this? And I told him, and I believe the same thing now, is the doctors have a loyalty to, to their existing patients, and they will follow those patients. So here we're talking about uh, Medicare patients. and. Yes, uh, practices can only tolerate uh, in some cir circumstances a, a certain percentage of Medi-Cal uh, patients before they, ca uh, they can't cut it anymore. But Medicare is bread and butter for medicine, as, as you know. And uh, these doctors will follow those patients. Uh, our experience with the SPDs is that it's not an all or none thing for those doctors. They don't have to s decide yes or no on Medi-Cal because we give them letters of agreement every day to just take care of the patients they have now, and we pay them at or above Medi-Cal rates. So this is a way of getting the physicians into the managed care system, and we believe it's going to be even more successful once we include the Medicare piece into this. Um, as far as the integration of long-term supports uh, and services, we think this is a vital piece of the prescription for better health care in our state. Um, while a state budget cannot support expanded community services, uh, we at the health plan are really excited about working with IHSS and others who we, re we really see as our closest allies in keeping our members healthy and in their homes and communities. So we ask that, uh, that a couple of things be uh, looked at in terms of transparency and a fuller information exchange. Um, we, Melina, as well as uh, the other health plans, needs information on new members' medical, social, and behavioral health histories uh, to help us coordinate their care and ensure for continuity. And uh, lastly, we ask for transparency in the preparation of managed care rates uh, so that they're actuarially sound and we're able to support and, and keep a, a quality uh, provider network as well as provide the services that we promise. Thanks for this opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Dr. Bakken. Equally pleased to hear of your positive experience, and I think we'll have any number of questions for you as well, <clears throat> given that you've actually had the experience that we're trying to identify so that we can move forward with confidence. Uh, Dr. Gilbert. Oh, I'm sorry, we have uh, Ms. Kahina next. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Vanessa Kahina with the Western Center on Law and Poverty. Uh, primarily, we wanted to thank you for at the beginning of this hearing reminding us the population that we're discussing today, which is 1.2 million vulnerable people who are in Medi-Cal and Medicare because they have high health needs and because they have low incomes. California's history with managed care is a long history, but traditionally, outside of county organized health systems, the only places where we've delivered managed care has been outside of the county organized health system with children and their families. So for the reasons including provider network adequacy and the interaction with health plans, we've traditionally left seniors and persons with disabilities and the dual beneficiaries out of managed care. Western Center was deeply involved in working with the legislature and with DHCS in creating a plan in the 1115 waiver as well as SB 208 that would do as little harm to beneficiaries as possible. Yet the portion of the waiver that mandatorily enrolls seniors and persons with disabilities into managed care plans has been poorly executed and the subsequent proposal to now mandatorily enroll every single dual beneficiary in California into managed care is problematic, mostly considering the size of the population, their complex health 
health needs and the additional requirement of mixing a federal and state payer. Our opinions regarding this proposal are greatly colored by our experience in the recent mandatory transition of seniors and persons with disabilities from fee-for-service into managed care. Numerous cases from our legal services programs around the state indicate severe barriers in accessing care for medically fragile beneficiaries as care is passed from a patient-provider relationship to one involving a health plan as a pass-through for care decisions and as patients are cut off from their doctors who do not contract with their new plan. While Western Center is in no way opposed, and I want to make this clear, we are not opposed to the concept of managed care, the transition of close to 375,000 beneficiaries over the course of the past year, while it's been phased in month by month, as Senator Alquist indicated, uh, over the course of the past year has yielded many problems. This includes um, existing authorization, authorizations for medications, treatments, and surgeries not being recognized for the new plan. Over 70% of beneficiaries were defaulted into health plans, which indicates a a lack of informed consent on their part, beneficiaries being moved into plans that do not include their providers, in a Byzantine process which we've been working on with the DHCS and the Department of Managed Health Care in order to obtain continuity of care or medical exemption requests to either stay in fee-for-service or to get the treatments that beneficiaries had been promised. This is a medically fragile group and a relatively small portion of the Medi-Cal population. Another important point that we've touched on this morning is the abject human failure of dental managed care in Sacramento County. Additionally, Dental managed care has been mandatory for years in Sacramento, and only now, after a significant amount of press, are we putting any brakes on this system. Our forthcoming letter will provide a greater enumeration of the problems in the proposal, but generally moving a population the size of San Jose and integrating long-term services and supports over the course of three years is audacious, to say the least. SB 208 provided us an opportunity to use four counties and to learn from it. We are impressed with the experience from many of the county organized health systems. Um, yet integrating the care for the dual eligibles at this point is a large process for the state to undertake right now. Moving all 10 counties to integrate all pieces of care immediately, including populous counties, removes the chance to attend to assess the potential problems or the benefits that might come from it. The time frame at this point also assumes that every single medical managed care beneficiary who's currently in a managed care county is going to be have their managed their medical transitioned all into managed care in this first year. That's over the course of 12 months. This is at the same time that the state is attempting to implement managed care in 28 additional fee-for-service counties. So, uh, so this is a huge undertaking, and we do have to ask about the ability of DHCS to undertake the large-scale delivery system changes with their existing capacity, the many responsibilities and changes involved with implementing health reform, and given the unresolved issues with the department in the transition of seniors and persons with disabilities. We do appreciate the Health and Human Services Agency's willingness to work with stakeholders and consumer advocates to develop a plan that is ultimately innovative and better coordinates care between two disparate systems. Yet the time frame with which we are faced makes it impossible to support a plan at this point which embarks on an unsure and unsecured journey with few safety valves over the course of three years. We ask to respect the existing duals plan as enumerated in SB 208 as approved by the legislature and are willing and ready to partner with HHS and the departments to develop a plan that delivers the right care to informed consumers and provides a process to hit pause when problems and barriers develop as they did in the SPD transition. I don't believe there's one member of this panel or a single member of the legislature on the dais today who would buy a car without brakes. We ask you to put the brakes on this proposal. Thank you, Ms. Kahina, for your difference of opinion. And uh, I'm sure we'll be back to you with some questions as well. So now we do move on to Dr. Gilbert. Thank you very much for the time. I'm a physician and a CEO, but I never forget that I'm a doctor. And that is actually, I think, one of the most critical pieces of thinking about care delivery. It's very frustrating when you say, you have to go over there for behavioral health. If you're in long-term care, I have to disenroll you. If you need this particular service, you have to call that particular entity. There's really no ability to pull it all together. We have a SNP plan, a special needs plan, so we have the Medicare experience. We have Medi-Cal, and not, not to differ slightly with Vanessa, but 25,000 seniors and persons with disabilities voluntarily chose IEHP before mandatory enrollment. So we've had a long history and experience of working with very vulnerable populations. This program brings it all together. There's no magic between four and 10. There's no magic. What I think is more important 
is to think about those plans in those counties that actually can do the job. So to me, thinking about the selection process and really being very careful to pick plans and counties that can make it work, which is a combination of county organized health systems that admittedly are ahead of some of the two plan models, but you've got two plan models that have extensive experience caring for these members. And Senator, I can't disagree with you that bad things happen in managed care, but we do not deny services that are needed. It doesn't make any sense fiscally or for the care of the patient. So the way we make access work is by shifting the dollars from the inpatient side and, and the ER side to be able to pay more for primary care physicians and specialists. That's how we make it work. It's not through denying needed services. I mean, I, I can tell you that because I was the medical director, the chief medical officer, and now the CEO. I've been there for 15 years. I mean, I can certainly speak for IEHP. So I want to talk about two things. Access, we, uh, you know, I just mentioned. I don't, uh, we have to get the members the care they need. Oversight. I just finished a DHCS review me, um, session. We have a DMHC medical audit coming up and I have two CMS audits coming up. So in terms of thinking about the oversight of the plans, there's really pretty good oversight. They added additional requirements with the SPD enrollment that I thought were very reasonable, sometimes, usually. Um, but, but the fact is they added additional oversight for that vulnerable population. So. I think the oversight's there. Do they need new pieces related to the long-term care and the long-term support services? Absolutely. So I'm gonna leave you with three things I think that are really important to think about. Number one, IHSS is absolutely critical to make this whole thing work. Those are giving critical services to individuals in their home that they need to stay in their home. So a couple things have to happen. One is we gotta make sure the counties are financially and programmatically okay. And we've got to make sure the IHSS program is kept stable with the caregiver, the direction by the member, all those pieces. But you've got to make it part of this process because you need that connection and that relationship. Two, for long-term care, good comments. Some of us don't have as much experience as others with long-term care. So we would argue for some kind of financial risk corridor with both an upside and a downside. If there's savings, we share it with the state. If there's losses that are unexpected, then we need some protection on that side. And then last, and this is really kind of related to the rate issue, care will improve day one. We meet every single week at our plan and we bring up any issue that's occurring with the new SPD member or any member from our care management, member services, utilization management, all parts of our plans. We meet as a group. Do we have problems with members? Do we have issues of continuity? Absolutely. Do we fix them? You bet, because it's in the best interest of the member. Pulling a member out of their current care system at City of Hope or UCLA doesn't make any sense. So we make it happen. And we look at that every single week, bring any cases or patients, members forward that we need to. So I think from the standpoint of oversight and making sure we're doing the right thing, I think you pick the right plans and counties. It's not a magic number of four or 10. You make it happen, you evaluate it, and it will absolutely be better for the member. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Have you ever made any commercials? <laughs> <laughs> that was great. No. I mean, I, I know you bring a particular perspective, but you presented it very well. It's really spontaneous. <laughs> I know that. And I suspect, and I'll say this to your credit, uh, you very much believe what you've just said. So uh, I appreciate your presentation. And uh, uh, Mr. Prindeville, you will be the last up. Yes, distinguished chairman and members, thank you for having me here today. Uh, the governor's proposal to expand the dual eligible integration demonstration goes too far, too fast, putting both beneficiaries and the state at risk. I'm Kevin Prindeville. I'm the deputy director of the National Senior Citizens Law Center, where we've been working very hard on this issue, both at the national level and here in California. I want to be clear that we support the goals that the legislature had laid out in 2010 in SB 208 for the dual eligible uh, integration project. In, in up to four counties, you know, doing pilots in up to four counties. And we've worked very closely with the department up to this point. I think um, we've been on this project longer than most of the staff at DHCS has been on this project. Um, meeting with the department, providing pages and pages of uh, feedback on comments that they've proposed, doing outreach to the community to, to engage stakeholders. And we've been convinced through that process that what we need to do, move, to do here is to move slowly to make sure that we properly protect the vulnerable individuals that are uh, at the crux of this. 
Um, the difficulty and complexity of designing an integrated model really cannot be understated. As has been discussed today, we're dealing with two things here essentially, bringing together Medi-Cal and Medicare, two programs that are decades old with reams and reams and reams of statutes, regulations, and sub-regulatory guidance. And then we're also bringing in LTSS to manage care. And as, 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 as good a job as, as the plans that you'll hear from today have done uh, with medical care management, really our medical managed care plans have had no experience providing long-term supports and services outside of COES providing institutional care. So we are starting from zero when thinking about providing IHSS, CBAS, MSSP in a managed care environment. Make no mistake about that. There's a lot of work to be done. And, and pointing to earlier questions today, what have we learned since the passage of SB 208 about integrating LTSS into managed care? We've learned nothing. There's been no new policy proposals put on the table or implemented at the state that have taught us more about how to do that, except the almost transition of the ADHC uh, beneficiaries into managed care, uh, which we can all agree was a disaster and continues to be a very difficult process as the settlement is put into place. So the department has considerable work to do and limited bandwidth to do it. Keep in mind that um, these uh, pilots would be uh, implemented just as the SPD transition is ending. And in 2014, we of course have health reform being implemented across the state at the same time as these duals demonstrations will be getting underway and expanding. Um, I could spend the remainder of, the, of our lunch <laughs> talking about all of the issues that have not yet been answered, and many of them have come up today, but just one, enrollment, where the, the department does seem to have made a decision about what they want to do with enrollment, but we still need to figure out which of those decisions CMS will approve. How will enrollment and, and disenrollment rights be operationalized in computer systems? How soon do they need to, to be put into those computer systems? Um, what will be the schedule for the phased enrollment? What kind of notice will be provided about enrollment rights? What will it say? When will it go out? Will there be independent enrollment brokers? Will, the, will there be funding for other community-based organizations to help people make enrollment choices? Will there be training and education? You know, these are just the types of questions that have yet to be answered by the department um, and that need to be answered through a thoughtful, slow process with stakeholder involvement and, and input from the legislature. Uh, to make it more complicated, these questions have to be answered in combination with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, as this is a, a demonstration of theirs. Um, and we've only got 10 months to do it until enrollment is scheduled to take effect. And we've only got seven months to make these decisions before beneficiaries are supposed to get their first notice of impending enrollment. Um, so we have serious concerns that, uh, that we can't get all of these decisions done in four counties, uh, not to mention in 10. Um, and the more counties, the more people we involve, I, I disagree with Brad, I think it becomes incrementally harder the more counties you add and the more people you add. We've been encouraging the department throughout this process to start in, in reasonably sized counties with plans like the health plan of San Mateo that have done a lot of work, a lot of the prep to get this done properly. We've opposed ideas to grow this as big as possible. If it, you put more people at risk, you also lower the bar for the plans that are gonna be involved. If we're trying to get in 750,000 people in year one, we're gonna be making sacrifices in the quality of the plans that, that, that we choose. And, and quite honestly, there aren't a lot of plans that have successfully provided benefits well to this population on both the Medi-Cal side and the Medicare side. There are a number of plans in California that have performed poorly on the Medicare side. Um, Mr. Prentville, if you could conclude soon. Yeah, please. I will conclude just to talk about what I think is the risk to the state here as well, not just to beneficiaries. But the governor has, the proposal would essentially put all of our eggs in, in this basket. And let's remember that this basket is a federal demonstration that's designed to only last three years. If the savings projections are not met and if quality is not improved, the demonstration will end. CMS has been very clear about that. Then where will the state go? after having made this investment in this policy. Um, so we believe that the prudent approach is one that, uh, the, the, that the legislature set out for us in SB 208. Um, four pilot counties implemented carefully and evaluated thoroughly before expansion. Thank you, Mr. Printerville. Uh, again, glad to have your somewhat contrarian voice here. And I wanna thank our staff committee members uh, for bringing us uh, such a great diverse uh, range of voices here because this is 
I think a lot of what we've just been presented with are touching on so many of the different issues we need to be considering. Uh, I'm gonna try and play devil's advocate to as many of you as I can, and we do have limited time. I know uh, Senator Emerson and Senator Smitty have some questions as well, and uh, once we conclude this panel, we'll get to our lunch break, and then we'll reconvene for the next panel, which specifically will touch on the administration's proposal for the integration of IHSS. On that point, I think the one thing we heard from just about everyone is how critically important that integration of IHSS is to the greater proposal that's before us. So I'm glad to hear that we have that one bit of agreement. <coughs> uh, I want to ask Ms. Kahina if you could uh, mm -hmm. give us a little bit more documentation as to why, and I think I got your words right, that you believe that the mandatory transition for SPDs to managed care has not been successful. I think you used those words, not successful. So, and then also if I could then get a response from Ms. Altman as to whether you would agree with the assessment from your public plan perspective. I'll probably defer to Dr. Gilbert since we've always had seniors. We didn't go through that transition. So okay, I'll defer to very Dr. good. The Western Center on Law and Poverty is a support center for legal services organizations and the Health Consumer Alliance based in 10 locations in California. What we tend to get are cases on behalf of legal services providers from beneficiaries who have had significant problems in accessing care. So it has started with a month-by-month -month phase in of the seniors and persons with disabilities through the SB 208 process in which at that point we felt that there was enough protection language to do as little harm as possible to beneficiaries. However, what we found in terms of the interaction, and I, I, I apologize to my colleagues on the panel here representing health plans because there are a wide number of health plans in the state. This is not to point fingers, but to say that the enforcement on behalf of DHCS and the understanding between plans and providers who might not have been in the network of the senior person with disability who gets transitioned into a plan, maybe does not have the best notification in front of them uh, without much outreach has, has been difficult to say the least. So what we have presented to us by our legal services providers or case by case, and we're happy to develop a systemic situation for you to look at in terms of looking at the numbers and the problems that have come up, but having a very difficult time getting the medical exemption requests that they had asked for in terms of treatment authorization requests that had been ordered by say their fee for service doctor before they were transition to a plan, not getting carried over. These tend to be some very time sensitive things and we do appreciate the plan's willingness to go through in their own processes and figure out the care that patients need. However, when you're talking about people on dialysis or people taking antipsychotic medications, all of a sudden being put into a different primary care provider, this becomes extremely problematic. So what we see on behalf of savvy consumers who know where to go when they're having problems is what we believe to be the tip of the iceberg. So your experience, of course, w would only be on the receiving end of problems. People this is aren't true. Be calling you to say things are working well. We wish people would. <laughs> so you have all this anecdotal information and it's important for us to know about it. W do you have any wherewithal, I don't know that you would, but you might, of knowing what percentage of the entire universe are what percentage is calling you so that we have a sense of it, it was one or two or three percent as in, uh, Ms. Altman's comments that there was only a 1.6% disenrollment, so you had a lot of satisfaction, or is it 50% of the universe who's calling you to say, we need help, this is not working? Right, and I do apologize that today I don't, don't have, have the number to right? give to you. <laughs> However, okay. we would be happy to put that together in terms of going through our case management database. Okay, and, and I'm told maybe DHS has some, some figures on this. Perhaps. Okay, so if you could provide, that'd be great. Happily. Uh, and then I wanted to ask, uh, Chairman, did you want me to respond to? Yes, go right ahead. Yeah. And then I have a question so for you, a follow-up question very, for you. Very quickly, um, two things. One is um, we've been enrolling approximately 3,000 members a month each month during the mandatory enrollment. That weekly meeting I talk about, we deal with more than one and less than five individuals that have a significant issue that needs to be resolved because we put in place exactly to Vanessa's point, if they have an outstanding authorization from fee-for-service, it is honored. So we honor that and we automatically approve if anyone has a surgery scheduled, an appointment with a specialist, whatever situation they have, 
we immediately honor that. Then we go behind that and try to figure out where's the member getting their care and what needs to happen. So from an anecdotal point of view from IEHP specifically, it's a very small percentage and we fix those from our perspective. Appreciate that. If you could briefly comment on this financial risk corridor you mentioned. So you're suggesting something different from what we have now. You what? said if there are savings, you want to share them back with the state. If there, if your costs aren't met, you want to be reimbursed. So the proposal, as you know, is a global capitation, partially paid by Medicare, the federal government, and partially paid by the state for the Medi-Cal piece. So we would get one, two capitations come together, become one payment. Those of us that have not had as much experience with long-term care, we do have responsibility now, but it's limited, don't necessarily know the full financial impact of that. So what we would like is within that capitation, a risk corridor that says if costs specifically for long-term care go higher than X percent above what is expected, the rate they give us, we would get protection above that. If they fell below, we would be willing to share those savings with the state. So it's a, it's a you know, you get a capitation rate, and you have a corridor on both sides for both an upside, for a, a downside risk protection and upside savings. Fairly standard in, I mean, the industry does that, not as much in governmental and, and medical. Okay, it, it, just on first hearing of this, it sounds to me that <coughs> the risk side is greater to you than the benefit and you want this corridor because it alleviates some of your risk. To give you order of magnitude, in our two counties, the long-term care costs are probably between the two counties that we cover, somewhere in the 600 to 700 million dollar range. So you can imagine if the rate was not done correctly, there's a pretty significant risk there. And I don't doubt that there is risk because we're moving into new territory without a doubt. Uh, Senator Emerson and then Senator Simidian. Uh, uh, Dr. Bach, uh, since your plan is a multi-state plan, I'm sure you have some uh, experience uh, in long-term care. Could you make some comments on, on other states in long-term care? Now we do have experience in uh, coordinating care amongst uh, medical, behavioral health, and long-term care. Uh, in our Washington plan, for example, uh, we co-located uh, behavioral health uh, with the primary care uh, facilities so that both sides of the uh, equation are, are met and those services are provided for the members. In Texas, there's a significant uh, integration of long-term supports and services, um, and I think even goes beyond uh, the level uh, that's proposed in this. And yes, there's a learning curve too, there's no question about that, um, but given the, uh, given the experience that we have in skilled nurse, uh, in, uh, well, the populations we've been given have been increasingly more difficult to, to manage. And I think we've been successful in all of those. And yes, we have our warts, but in terms of your best option, I think you're looking at it. And uh, we do step up to these challenges. We provide the services that are required and um, we take it seriously to, to get the right uh, mix of services and the right partnerships uh, to get what's necessary for our beneficiaries. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Smidian. Thank you. A question for two of the panelists, if I may, Mr. Chairman, and then a brief comment. The question first for Mr. Prindeville and then uh, to Ms. Kahina is, you both <coughs> expressed a great deal of concern, particularly around the magnitude of change in a relatively short period of time. <coughs> you put a lot of information into the record today with a relatively uh, limited time period, so I, I understand that. Let me start with Ms. Prindeville. Here's the question, and it'll be the same question for Ms. Kahina. So if you said, what, if I were to ask you, what is the one thing you most worry about if we move forward with this program at this pace in terms of its real life impact on people in California? I understand all the process concerns, I understand the timeline concerns, but in terms of, uh, you know, going home, talking to our folks on the weekend at a farmer's market and having folks walk up and say, here's what happened to me. What is the thing that you think we should be worried about, the single most worrisome thing in all of this in your judgment? So our biggest worry is that people will lose access to providers and services. Because? Because right now, especially for duals, they have access to sets of Medicare doctors that participate in the fee-for-service Medicare system. 
passively enrolling them into managed care provider networks on the Medicare side will greatly decrease the number of Medicare providers that they have access to. And I guarantee you that when you go home, if people lost access to their Medicare docs, you will hear about it. Uh, you know how much Californians care about their Medicare program. Thank we, you. Well, and, and services is the other side, especially with the integration of long-term supports and services. We're moving from a model that delivers those services through a social lens to one which delivers them through a medical lens. And that will equate to people receiving different services than they do today is our concern. Ms. Kahina? From us and having more experience on the Medi-Cal side of things, I think that our main concern at this point would not necessarily be with the four county pilot demonstration, but more to the effect that if we start to move this very quickly with you know 750,000 divided by 12 months in the year, dealing with this volume of transition on a county by county basis in every managed care county, and asking DHCS to undertake that process while simultaneously attempting to expand managed care in 28 additional counties and implementing the Affordable Care Act is of great concern. And the real life impact that that could have if it doesn't work well on real people that we represent in our districts that you worry about is what? Delays and continuity of care provisions and medical exemption requests. So the treatments that people have been promised that DHCS could then say, okay, we can keep them defaulted into their old fee-for-service provider for an additional number of months would be delayed. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the one comment I want to make, and it, it, it occurs to me from time to time, but it particularly occurred to me during the course this morning's conversation is, I think, um, one of the things I've learned over the years in the work we do is that it, it's easy sometimes to think that the world looks like the place you come from. So f for each of us who represents one of 40 state Senate districts, it's easy to think that that's what California is. In fact, California is a much larger place and a much more diverse place. And uh, so- I don't think that. <laughs> well, well, it, it's, I, I, think, I think one of the things you learn from your work is just how different the world is. When Senator Emerson and I talk, you know, I think we both realize that people have a different point of view on some topics in his district than they might in my district and vice versa. Oh, no. and, and as we've heard from people today, I, it may well be that each one of your stories and your experiences and, and the comments that you make are, are accurate and illustrative from your experience. But there are different experiences in different places. And so I think the thing we need to take away from the exercise today is, that we want to say, all right, what are some of the very best practices? What are some of the success stories around the state? And how can we replicate them? And what are the shortcomings and what are the failures that we find not everywhere, but too often? And how can we avoid them as we go forward? And if we don't all think that the world works wonderfully well because the place we come from works wonderfully well, that'll make us a little more sensitive to the legitimate concerns of others. By the same token, you know, for those who are dealing with failed systems far too often, important to remember that there are successful systems in place and uh, how can we tap into those? Thank you, Senator Simidian. Um, uh, we have uh, another question from not, Senator Negretti McLeod. It's not a question, it's, it's just a, a statement. I wanna thank IEHP and Molina for working in my district and making it a good program, that's all. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I think we'll conclude with this. Uh, I, uh, Mr. Prenderville, I th heard you any number of times uh, issue your concern about timing. And I think that's one of the big <laughs> questions we have yet to resolve among ourselves. So I wanted to, uh, uh, not to put you on the spot, but if you had any critical assessment of some of the rosy reports that we heard from uh, Dr. Bach and Dr. Gilbert, if. if if you think there's any information or, or perspective that we need to be approaching that rosy assessment from, or if you think in their own experiences they've had those successes, but there's still the question of can we implement something so large so fast? Yeah, I think our concerns on timing are um, perhaps disconnected to a rosy or not assessment. I, I think we've been talking uh, uh, that even if all the policy is right and the actors are right and everybody's intentions are, are perfect, we know from experiences in the SPD transition and the transition of duals to Medicare Part D that these systems take time to set up. 
Um, we were involved in litigation against the federal government around how Medicare Part D went into place and learned a great deal about the computer systems that are necessary to effectuate enrollments into plans. And if we haven't even decided yet which plans they're gonna be and what the rules are gonna be for the enrollments, we might be too late in, in setting up computer systems that will work properly come January. So yeah, our, our concerns about timing assume that everybody agrees on the same policy and it's the right policy, but it takes time to put a notice together to make sure it says the right thing, to get it translated, to get it out to individuals, to train people, to let providers know that these changes are coming. You know, this program was originally targeted to be implemented in 2012, but the timeline thankfully has pushed back and we may need to be open to pushing it again. But the more we try to take on, the harder it's going to be to get to where we, where we wanna go. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Prindeville. And then I'm gonna ask Dr. Uh, Gilbert just one last question. Uh, with regard to Mr. Prindeville's concern about availability, access and availability, uh, with the mandatory enrollment, uh, with loss of Medicare providers, from your experience? So we have a Medicare special needs plan, so we have Medicare providers. And, and actually one of the things we would do between now and January 1 is add additional Medicare providers for that exact reason. So we've had more interest from groups that have traditionally not done Medi-Cal that now want to do Medicare and Medi-Cal with us, which significantly improves the network. Lots of more doctors, many of whom do Medicare. So would we have to look at that and expand? Yes, to, to take care of his exact issue of the, the current, the patients seeing current uh, Medicare physicians that are not in our network. So we would have to get there. And we're already, we're actually already en route to that, regardless of what happens. Ms. Altman, you wanna have the last word? Yes, um, what I was talking about was our experience with Medicare, um, the passive enrollment process. And what we did was, we were three things. First of all, we kept an open system, an open network for a long time. So instead of forcing people to change doctors, we went after the doctors that they already had and we got them to contract with us. Even if they didn't contract with them, we paid them as non-contracted providers. We did not insist that people change, um, change their doctors and we kept that net network open for years. We've only recently closed it. Secondly, we worked intensively with providers to make sure that they understood the program, to um, answer all their questions and to make it as easy as possible to make sure they were being paid at least as much as they were getting under the, the current Medicare system, and that included hospitals. Um, and the third thing is we worked intensively with the members. So it is possible to do it, and I think I go back to the issue of the best practices. I mean, there are lessons that can be learned about how it was done and, and, and how it was done successfully. Thank you. Well, we really appreciate all of your input today. It's been very informative for us. I think it's been a great panel. So again, thank you for your time and for your expertise. So it is now 12.45. Committee members, you think we could convene at 1.30 or 1.45? Let's see, uh, take care. 1.30? All right, we will reconvene at 1.30. Thank you.